All right, so you don't have to take any notes for this lecture. You all can just relax and try to absorb this massive amount of information I'm going to be throwing you. Um, so this lecture is entirely on how to use Metasploit as if you've never seen it before. Um, take you through a number of examples. I did not sacrifice the proper number of virgins, goats, and various other animals to the demo god, so some of my demos that I prepared were broken, but at least I have the most important one at the end working. Um, so let's begin. Um, I'm going to go over the overview of Metasploit, then dive into the interfaces, uh, how to use the database, um, the, its utilities, and go into something totally awesome called Social Engineer's Toolkit that's involved with it. Um, so, uh, I have to mention that though this class is called Offensive Security, it is not affiliated whatsoever with the Offensive Security team at this URL. Um, and they are responsible for Backtrack and a number of guys on Metasploit. Um, and also, the information presented in this lecture, you are responsible for how you use it and act responsibly. The difference between penetration testing and hacking is permission. So Metasploit is not just a tool, it's an entire framework for automating various tasks for penetration testing and attacking. It allows you to easily throw together complex attack vectors, it allows uh, the use of scanners, various different exploits for various different architectures, um, all the payloads that could go along with that as well, as well as encoders for defeating various different types of filters and security mechanisms that may, mitig may hinder an attacker but can still be overcome. So it's completely open source. It's written in Ruby and it's designed by this guy that people either love him or hate him. He's called H.D. Moore. The people who hate him also happen to completely hate Ruby and I think that's the same reason. Um, so he's uh, like the big guy behind Rapid7 as far as I know and they maintain it and it's wonderful that such a tool exists and it's completely free. And uh, Backtrack is a penetration uh, testing distribution, uh, Ubuntu Debian based. Um, and it comes basically with Metasploit completely set up configured for the most part. Um, and so using a distribution like that and a framework like Metasploit makes life super easy for both good guys and bad guys. So there's a lot of good resources out here, out there. I'm gonna pass around the first book. Just take a look at it, pass it around. It's worth buying. Uh, Metasploit Penetration Tester's Guide. Um, there are wonderful cheat sheets in the back of it for how to use all the utilities that I'm going over today. It has basically uh, small exercises and uh, tutorials in more depth than you can even find on the wiki that's maintained by the offensive security team. Um, and there's also uh, uh, a basically like the equivalent of Khan Academy for security called securitytube.net. Um, it's a wonderful uh, community uh, resource where basically security topics, how to use this uh, tool, how to understand this algorithm are broken down to about 10, maybe 20 minute lectures. And all those videos are there at SecurityTube. So it's an entire category of videos from basically start to finish, from noob to pro on how to get uh, familiar with Metasploit. So, Metasploit, some people say it lets you hack like the movies, um, but I don't know, I don't have a penchant for a totally crappy looking monitor, uh, multi-monitor stand thingy, and at the bottom left is the obligatory YouTube video that I linked from NCIS where they have two people working on the same keyboard beating a hacker, and that obviously is the stupidest thing in the world. So the movies don't really get it light, right. Um, besides, real life is way cooler. I mean, this sh stuff you can do on your mobile phone now. That's with Desploit in the bottom left. And in next week, or the week after that, we're going to have a graduate researcher, Mike Mitchell, come in with his quadcopter. And we're going to do exactly this in the bottom right. We're going to have a drone in here with a Wi-Fi network and attack the Wi-Fi network and basically man the middle anyone who connects to it. Um, and show you just how fun this stuff can be. So if you want, you can bring your sunglasses and suit. <laughs> so that probably won't be videotaped like the other lectures. So terminology going into Metasploit is that 
Exploits refer to the means by which an attacker or pen tester takes advantage of a flaw within a system. A payload is the code that we want the attack the we the pen testers or attackers want the system to execute in the exploit. So there are three types of payloads. They're called singles, stagers, and stages. And we'll go over that in more detail in a second. Other main terminology is Main components in Metasploit are modules. It's basically it's just an abstract thing. It's a piece of software that can be used by Metasploit framework. Um, so, and then there's also listeners, and listeners are usually something done in hand with anything that involves a payload that connects back to the attacker. You have to have a listener to handle that connect back exploit, or often called reverse exploit. So. This is the general architecture to Metasploit. Um, the MSF core and MSF base are Ruby, basically libraries and APIs that tie everything together. MSF core basically defines Metasploit framework. MSF base makes it friendly to use. So MSF base makes it easy for all the modules to interface with all the components that MSF uh, interacts with. Um, it's worth mentioning that on this diagram, the database is not even included. Um, so it allows for basically uh, API uh, to interact with the database plugin. Um, so we have modules here, and then interfaces are basically the ways you actually get Metasploit as a framework to do things with all the other modules. Um, and then uh, there's things called utilities that basically are single purpose uh, uh, functionality providers or basically limited couple functionality <coughs> providers for these modules. Um, so the file system architecture for Metasploit when it's actually deployed is pretty simple. Uh, it shouldn't be confused with the file system that's set up for all the tools and backtrack. That's totally different. The folder, the directory, wherever it's located in backtrack or whichever distribution you set it up in, uh, housing Metasploit is intuitively laid out. Basically, data, data, it's all straightforward. Data has editable files that are used for configuration and whatnot. Um, lib is really what provides the meat of the code base for the framework. So if you really want to get into uh, the code of Metasploit, you'll find all the, basically, the good stuff there. Um, and then scripts are in the scripts directory. Plugins are in the plugins directory. And you can have private custom plugins that uh, are actually located uh, somewhere else. And I'll cover that. So I covered this, basically the main libraries, MSF core, MSF base. Um, so modules are typically located um, in that modules folder. And so opt Metasploit MSF3 is the, the usual directory for Metasploit within Backtrack. Um, and so it is actually very common for uh, professional pen testers to write their own custom modules that they don't release, um, especially for things like encoders. Because encoders are a good way to defeat antivirus and, sig uh, and, and intrusion based yeah, intrusion detection systems, um, these companies that run them and maintain them take Metasploit and take the open encoders out there and run all combinations that you can think of and generate signatures for them so they can have a better hopes of defeating these things out of the box. So a lot of encoders fail in interesting ways and it always makes life harder when actually the IDS is beating your decoder, encoder. So it's not too difficult to design a encoder for a payload. Um, some of you have uh, actually chosen this for your term project and I'm pretty happy about that. So the modules basically are broken down to exploits. And what categorizes that is that any module that uses a payload is uh, supposed to be located in the exploits module. Um, payloads are basically standalone uh, that aren't uh, accompanied by something that delivers it. Um, so and then encoders basically uh, they do the, the encoding, the filter evasion uh, to beat WAFs, IDS, AV, 
Um, NOPS is straightforward. It's the tools to generate NOPS lists to keep, keep things nice and even sized. Um, and then there's miscellaneous modules and auxiliary, but also in auxiliary are, are exploits that aren't associated uh, with any payload. Um, and then there's also post-exploitation, which we'll cover another time. So that's all the modules right there. And let's get to the interfaces. So there's three ways to basically control the majority of the things in Metasploit. The first one, everyone, if they want to get to know Metasploit, should start learning. Otherwise, you kind of curb uh, your ability to learn everything if you uh, go another route, is MSF console. So MSF console is the most popular. It's, it's command line. Um, basically, it, it, it spawns. Uh, it provides its own uh, command line prompt to the Metasploit framework. Um, it's also the most flexible and the most feature rich. You can do 100% of the things that Metasploit can offer with this. Um, it is also the most supported by uh, developers and the community. And it's also the only interface that supports uh, plugins, as far as I read on the offensive security uh, wiki, I think. Um, so MSF console. There's a number of ways to basically, whenever you're learning something, you should always learn how to figure out more information about stuff first. So help will generally tell you what commands are valid at any given stage, at any given context of the console prompt you're provided. Um, and then for uh, viewing options of a specific module, you can use show to see the options. Now to search for a specific exploit or module that you have in mind, you type search and then whatever uh, keyword you're looking for. So to make use of a particular module, you would issue the use command. For instance, use Windows shell reverse TCP. And this would just be basically a payload. Um, it's not an exploit, so there's nothing to drop it by itself. But you can see the options. Once you type use, the next uh, prompt will be spawned in the context of that module. So then if you hit show options there, it'll show options of that context of that payload. So what it lists here is basically the options that are required for this. The default settings are listed here in the current settings and it says what's required. So there's one that's required that is not currently set, so that's always basically something you're going to have to set up. And it's pretty straightforward on how to do that. Um, this overlapped a little bit. But essentially, in the same context, you type set L host to be whatever the IP address that you need. Um, for the attacker to, to listen on. Basically, for the, the victim to connect back to. Uh, so, uh, when you're done poking around in certain modules, you need to basically uh, get back to the previous context you were in and the command line. You can do that with the back command. Um, so if you want to you want to use something, you hit use, and if you're done, you you issue back. It's really rather straightforward. Um, so this is one of my broken demos that I at least have backup slides for all of these things. So. If I wanted to use an actual exploit, so exploit is something that exploits a vulnerability and executes a payload. Payload does not execute any vulnerability. It's just something that can be executed when it exploit is when a vulnerability is exploited. So we're going to actually use an exploit, and we're going to exploit uh, MS 03026 DCOM. Uh, it's a tricky one to exploit because it's really old. It usually never works, but it's reliable when it does but it also can cause uh, a core system process to crash. And then Windows basically complains, you need to shut down in 10 seconds, but that's all an attacker needs to do a lot of nasty stuff, like add a new user account to log in again next time. So what you would do is you'd issue the use command for that, and then you can see the options for it. Um, the only one you need to fill in is basically the IP address to set the target. So set the target of who you're going to, what machine you're going to attack with this. In this instance, I'm just attacking something that I've set up locally. 
and it doesn't exploit at that point. It doesn't uh, execute the exploit at that point. Um, there's two options uh, that involve this. It's one that's not always supported called check. Some exploit modules do support you checking to see if the vulnerability actually exists on the target. Um, however, it's something that the, that module author has to implement the functionality of. So it's not always there. What always has to be implemented is the functionality to exploit it. So in this instance, I issue check and it reports back that it does not support the check. So when I issue exploit, um, you can see the commands or the activity of Metasploit here. It first starts the reverse handler and then uh, it starts targeting the, the, uh, the victim, identifies as Windows NT uh, uh, family, and you can see it sends the exploit, sends the stage, and so the stage is going to be a interpreter session, and this essentially allows for a Linux-style uh, command line shell access to a, a Windows system, which is very useful for people who aren't familiar with DOS and the command prompt of Windows uh, systems. <coughs> Um, so you can type things like ls and uh, ifconfig, and it will basically interpret it properly and handle it in the Windows style. And there's a lot of lot of functionality that the interpreter offers, and we'll cover that in a later lecture. So the second interface to Metasploit is something that's less interactive. It's more of a one-off thing. And it's just single command line interface for Metasploit. Um, it's important for, uh, it, it was designed in t mainly for, to provide scripting. So you can strip many of the functionalities of Metasploit uh, into various other tools, exploits, your own custom exploits. And early on it was designed mainly to allow more functionality and compatibility with other tools that perhaps weren't integrated in some manner to the framework or in a friendly way. So you can basically command line style pipe input and output between things. Um, so it's not as user friendly, but it still works. So this is my second broken demo. <laughs> so I essentially have a screenshot of a Windows host um, and the IP address I have here. So when you want to select uh, an exploit with MSF Cloud, you essentially have to know what you're doing. Um, you can't navigate around, shop around for the exploits and the modules and search for things and then show options in that interactive way that MSF Console offers. Um, but you can still do this to an extent. Um, if you specify what module you're interested in, you can show all the options with the capital O following it. Um, so in this instance, I'm interested in using the MS-08067 uh, exploit that's shown in every Metasploit tutorial that just out, uh, pones uh, Windows XP Service Pack 0, 1, and 2, and Vista Service Pack 0 and 1 systems out of the box um, and provides high reliability of that. So the options on this show that you have to set the target and everything else works out, uh, with the uh, default values. So setting the target here would be syntactically just a little bit different. You have it set on the command line here and you use the equal sign as opposed to a space, which you would use in the command line. It's just a small little difference that's easy to figure out. So <clears throat> this demonstrates basically uh, miscellaneous exploit and we can uh, tie it together with a number of different payloads. So in this instance, we want to just uh, execute as our payload some shell code, some Windows 32-bit shell code that's going to uh, open a port and just bind to it. And so the attacker will then connect to it. So it's going to open a backdoor and just listen for attackers to connect. Um, 
And so when you set everything up, in order to execute it with MSF Cloud, you have to have uh, capital E at the end. So I have this screenshot of it executing. Um, Difficult to pass to see as we get back in the room, but um, essentially, um, some interesting things that I'm going to note is that it automatically encodes uh, the payload. I did not specify it to; it does it by uh, default um, a set number of times. I think that's specified in a config file, and then it basically, once this has been exploited, it sends. Uh, well, it, it sends uh, this stage. So this is the, the stager. So this is basically the second half of that screenshot is that right after sending the encode stage in my, uh, in my console right there, I get basically a shell, system 32. So which brings me to the last interface for or for Metasploit. Um, it's the most user friendly because it's entirely point and click. Um, so Armitage is a GUI that was designed by Raphael Mudd, and I spent a decent amount of time learning it myself. Um, it's entirely point and click. <laughs> it's hilariously easy to use. Um, you can spawn it from any command line and backtrack. Just type Armitage. Um, the most interesting thing about it is that it was designed by him in his desire to make his life as a red team judge easier. Uh, he used to be a CCDC uh, red team judge. And so this GUI allows you to, in a nice organized manner, uh, manage exploiting many systems in a, uh, a wide network. Um, you can see basically all of them there in a, in a panel. I have a screenshot of it next. And he went several steps beyond that, and he developed support for bots. So you can automate several uh, aspects of Metasploit. So you can automate uh, end mapping every now and then. And then once you say you've exploited a host, you can have that host end map to discover its neighbors. Perhaps it's in a different uh, sub-network. Um, so uh, there was actually, well, before that, this is a guy who likes to write his own languages. Um, so there's going to be some difficulty if anyone wants to ever learn this. Um, it's basically all written in a language called Cortana, which is based off a language he also designed called Sleep. Sleep is basically a mix between Perl's regex string handling, function parameter handling, and the rest of it is kind of like a mix of bash. Um, and so. What's really actually interesting about all this is that a very recent update, I think last week or two weeks ago, supported scripting, third-party tools, and really interesting communication between the bots. So you can have bots automate things, do things, and then communicate with each other. So essentially, you have this nice point-and-click GUI that you can administrate <coughs> casually a botnet. So it's fun. So it's fun to use. It won't provide as much functionality as MSF console or MSF CLI. And sometimes it defaults to 32 bit payloads. Um, but so this is essentially what it looks like. Um, you could, if time permits, I'll start it up and show you. But it takes a bit of time. And I have a lot of slides to get through, about 90. So uh, we'll go, I'll have a demo on this next week or so. so Another important aspect, especially for penetration testers, is the database behind Metasploit because it helps audit every single thing that a pen tester does, which is extremely useful for providing a report saying, I did exactly this and I can prove it. And you often end up doing a ton of things that sometimes you forget. It's nice having everything logged in a nice organized manner. So like I said earlier, within MSF console, if you type help and a specific thing, it will show you basic commands that are involved with that uh, component of the framework. So if you type help database, it'll show you basically all the related commands. Um, we see that there's basically a few reports that you can see. Uh, it'll dump credentials that is uh, had stored in it. It'll dump any host that's discovered from Nmap scans. It'll dump any loot, which is basically any password hashes that have been stolen by any successful attacks 
done within Metasploit. Um, you can also leave yourself notes and many things log here as well. Um, services actually is uh, a, uh, it's a, basically every, every shell, interpreter shell, or shell that's uh, been picked up by a listener gets logged in the sessions table. And so you can switch between sessions and if you pick the session and done what you wanted to to that victim, you can send it to the background and type background and then switch between sections on the fly. So at the end, I'm gonna show you uh, a little bit of that um, with the social engineer toolkit, which um, is just like, it's amazing. <laughs> Um, it'll probably blow your minds because you haven't been working with this stuff a lot. So, volumes will basically uh, list. I'll get to that. I have examples on that. So, the database has to be configured a little bit uh, beforehand, um, but it's built in with basically Postgres SQL. Um, so, it's really nice because it actually also allows for importing and exporting results from and to third-party tools. So if you have a tool that you like to use and it can export results in a clean manner, you can import those results into Metasploit so you have everything organized in that one same database. Um, so that's really great for keeping results clean and organized. So um, you can actually organize the workspaces for whatever you're doing. Uh, so it always creates a default workspace and always uses it. Um, if you want to create a new one, you just type workspace minus A and whatever you want to name it. Uh, and again, this is all within the MSF console. So, and then you switch to it by workspace, whatever it is. You delete it with workspace minus D. And if you need any help, workspace hyphen H. So, um, like I said earlier, hosts is that database report that will list all the hosts discovered and an end map scan. Um, did you go forward or back? I don't know. Okay, so services uh, will display all the open ports and services, and also, uh, actually, not all the open. It will display all the information about all the ports and services gathered so far from uh, the most recent end map scans. Um, so, uh, like I said about Volms, as I was about to get to, um, any successfully utilized vulnerabilities, and basically exploits or uh, discovered vulnerabilities, get logged here. And so that's an excellent way to basically provide uh, a, a client of a pen test saying, this is exactly what I was able to exploit, and here are details. Um, so this is a nice standardized way of providing this information. So, the other uh, options were db underscore something else. Um, so, db underscore nmap scan is essentially nmap, and it takes all of the output and puts it in the database right for you. Um, so, all of this information is used to populate the hosts and services reports. So you can import from other tools. Um, basically, you do db underscore import, and you paste, uh, pass it basically the path, the absolute path that doesn't uh, recognize uh, uh, symbolic paths, so tilde won't work to your home directory, um, to wherever the report is. And it'll do a file format auto detection, and it's pretty friendly. Um, so it works really well with uh, most tools that export XML results by default. <clears throat> so, loot, uh, like I said, will uh, display, is populated um, with all the hash dumps and credentials stolen from uh, victimized systems. So, um, when, say, you're perhaps done <coughs> gathering all the information for the day or with whatever you're doing, um, it's always wise to export the database, perhaps to an XML file, so you could import it later or uh, use it in a report for later. Um, it's also very wise for basically taking like snapshots or checkpoints of your progress. So, 
the Metasploit utilities kind of take your standard tool and can make it go crazy yeah. in a good way. Um, is there any so like there's any like does it provide functionality to sort of like replay? Uh, let's say I exported my work for one day and I have a, a multi-stage uh, you know, vulnerability. Like, like I've done step one and two, and I'm working on step three. Like can, can to I, rewind. Well, like can I just like sort of if I've exported my what I've previously done, can I sort of like replay what I've you know, is there any like replay or that kind of not really. Okay. Uh, because in most of these cases, you're dealing with something over the network. And when you're trying to recreate and replay and rewind uh, in a friendly way, that you have to have complete control over everything and be able to control it on all ends. And I, don't I just meant like replay as in like the commands that I've run so far, just run those again. Uh, there is a command history I don't know off the top of my head. So you could easily go by that. And redo it yourself. There, there may be a way. Um, so, there's other interfaces to Metasploit, but they're typically called utilities because they typically just directly interface one aspect of Metasploit. So, for instance, MSF payload uh, provides just uh, basically access to the payloads uh, module as well as ability to generate new payloads. Um, MSF encode provides just access to the encoding modules. Um, MSF Venom is really cool. It combines basically MSF payload and MSF encode. Um, and NASM shell is uh, low level kind of payload stuff. So NASM shell is what I'm gonna go over first because whenever you're developing uh, uh, shell code on your own from scratch, you'll have to think about the null bytes. But it's really hard thinking just from the assembly level, which instructions are going to cause a null byte when they're assembled. It's actually impossible unless you are actually an assembler yourself. And if you are, and you're sitting in this room, uh, please come see me after class. Please can steal your brain. Um, so this is a friendly tool that's basically a command line interface that allows you to basically as, uh, assembly instruction by assembly instruction, compile it, and see exactly what the opcodes are. So. It works for 32-bit and 64-bit. Um, I could show a demo of it, but it's really straightforward. You just find it in the framework, um, find uh, forward slash hyphen name NASM shell dot RB would find it for you if it weren't in a standard location. Um, so you would just type, if you wanted to see what Zor EAX, EBX uh, assembled to, you would type it, hit enter, and it would tell you it, it assembles to 3.1.d8. Um, so it's really great for seeing exactly uh, what instructions might be wise to employ. And so when you're working with shellcode, you get familiar with very uh, various instructions, and you become familiar with them as being safe because you start using them over and over and over. So seeing new instructions that you might be considering using this is a quick and easy way to check and make sure it's going to be safe in whatever shell code. So that's all great if you actually want to work at that level. If you don't like shell code and starting from scratch and doing it all, um, there, there's MSF payload and there's MSF venom for you. Um, MSF payload will generate simple shell code in many different formats. Um, however, I should note that the the shellcode generation does not avoid uh, null bytes, and it does not avoid any uh, bad characters because bad characters are not uh, shellcode specific. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, so, to get any help with the MSF payload utility, you type MSF payload hyphen H. So I mentioned there's three types of payloads earlier. So there's singles, stagers, and stages. Singles are basically self-contained and standalone payloads. It can be as simple as the assembly instructions to, to spawn Firefox.exe or the assembly instructions to add a new user account to a system. Or perhaps it doesn't have to be at the assembly level at all. Um, it depends on basically the vulnerability. So stagers, basically their purpose is to upload uh, 
stages or payloads so <clears throat> that aren't self-contained. So essentially, the, the common purpose of stagers is to set up a reliable network connection between the victim and attacker and upload the stage or the, the payload over that connection. Um, so sometimes it's actually common to have multiple stagers be chained together, depending on the environment. So stages um, are essentially payloads that are not self-contained and standalone and require such additional support uh, or, uh, for establishing a network connection. Um, however, uh, stages, since you establish that, uh, often involve things like Mesploit uh, consoles or, uh, not Mesploit, Meterpreter uh, shells um, and uh, power shells. So, MSF payload allows access to a vast array of different types of shellcode. Um, and so, for those of you who have hated actually writing your shellcode through the class, well, there's enough shellcode here that you'll probably never have to write it ever from scratch, um, unless you want to work on something brand new. So all of the shellcode that's here can easily be modified and customized. It's very well documented, and MSF payload hyphen L will list basically everything there is. Um, and so when setting things up in MSF payload, the options for the payloads are set by a command line. So to see the options for perhaps uh, the payload for spawning a reverse TCP shell on Windows 32-bit, you would type that and capital O at the end. And it shows you the information, shows you basically uh, the architecture, which is x86, 32-bit. It even tells you basically if they listed the authors and how to contact them, if you have any questions. And then it tells you the options you'd have to set. And here you have to set the, basically, the, the listen address. So. Which brings me to the next point. Once you set it up, you need to have some, uh, essentially, uh, you have to specify which format you want it to output. So this example happens to be x86 architecture. Um, there's obviously 64-bit version of x86. There's ARM. There's Atom, which is also x86-based. There's MIPS. There's PowerPC hardly even use it anymore, probably on legacy systems still. Uh, there's tons of different mobile ones, and those are actually, uh, there's very sparse collections of shellcode for them, but they're always interesting to look at. So there's different options for presenting, for commanding MSF payload to present the output of the payload for you. Um, the most commonly used one is raw. So for the architecture, it will basically output the raw instructions for that. So for x86, it's going to be raw, basically, opcodes. So it's going to be raw binary data. So um, if it were something else, say it's a, a client-side web browser vulnerability that you want to exploit, and you want to have basically this exploit hosted on a malicious website, and you need some way to exploit to execute it on the client's PC. Well, a good option for the format of this exploit would be JavaScript. If the if the victim has JavaScript enabled, navigates to the site, it will execute this JavaScript that's given by the MSF payload, and then will have the functionality of whatever you command it to. So. <clears throat> Here are some examples. Um, so in this instance, I've set up basically the aforementioned example, specified the, 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 the listener to connect back to, and the port to connect back to, and I have it export in C. So this makes it easy to test as well. Um, and say perhaps it's actually a content management system or a web application vulnerability, and I can upload my own file. Um, this is actually 
compiled in such a way that when it's escaped, it's rendered as valid PHP instructions. Um, because it is actually, I think it's, uh, yes. I guess it gets executed basically as Perl. So it's an interesting combination. Um, I haven't actually viewed the source for it. Uh, so this will ex export it in basically PHP format and that's supported there. So the mileage there will vary um, and it can get a little confusing when mixing uh, things with uh, output formats that they're obviously never intended for, such as exporting a reverse Perl shell for PHP architecture to C. Obviously, never was meant to happen and it's probably not going to work. Um, so, the problem with that is the MSF payload does not avoid null bytes. And in many uh, exploits, um, especially over the network, there are various other factors that can cause an exploit, cause a payload to fail. Um, because there are things called bad bytes. In many networking protocols, such as like Telnet um, and others, there are bad bytes that actually indicate the terminator for that, uh, for that string, for that packet, or for that data. So slash uh, XOA, I think, is, I can't remember off the top of my head, I think it's new line or something. That's, that's all right, yeah. So. That would basically cause the, the exploit, the, the payload rather, to get truncated right there. And so you lose the rest of your exploit code past that. So MSF code exists. Its input is raw output from uh, MSF payload. And so the raw output would be specific to whatever architecture it is. So if it's, if it's x86, it can be raw x86 instructions that have been assembled. Um, so there's an important distinction that's going that needs to be made, and you need to remember it, is that null bytes are shellcode specific. Bad bytes that cause the truncation of uh, your payload or your exploit over the wire are exploit specific. So that's a result of some sort of operation being performed on the payload before the payload actually gets executed. So, to combat this problem, uh, MSF Encode supports a number of encoder algorithms. Um, and like I said, the security industry frequently watches these, pub these uh, uh, publicly available encoder algorithms so it can find all sorts, all combinations of signatures to protect against them. Um, because nothing hurts your business more than some pen tester rolling up to one of your clients and just using everything out of the box and working and to pwn their systems. And so since they do that, smart attackers write their own. So those of you who have chosen to do that for your term project, kudos to you. So to list the various encoder algorithms for MSF encode, you would just give it hyphen L. So the supported platforms so far are x86, x64, PHP, Spark, MIPS, and PowerPC. Um, so the default encoder that MSF encode always chooses is uh, Shikata Gai Ganai. Um, it's the only one that uh, has been ranked as excellent by the development team. So they basically have a set of trials to grade the rank of these uh, these uh, encoder algorithms. Mm. So in the list, it describes what it is. And in this case, it's a polymorphic XOR additive feedback encoder. So the source code for basically the encoder is somewhere there in the uh, encoder module uh, source. So if you are interested in writing your own encoder, you can actually look at how others have done it as well and to make sure yours is novel and not going to get caught by the existing signatures. Um, so many of these encoding options actually, even though this one's the default one and it's ranked excellent, it may not be appropriate for all situations. So some of these are actually specifically designed for certain situations where others would actually, even though they're excellently ranked and 
totally reliable, would actually fail. So, which brings me to MSF Venom, which is a utility for basically generating custom shell code. Um, it's super easy to use. Uh, it's basically a combination of MSF payload and MSF encode. It supports both 32 and 64 bit. Um, multiple architectures that supports just like MSF payload. Um, you can actually customize the commands you want your payload to do rather easily, other than perhaps just spawn a shell. You could do something specific like uh, add a user to the system. Add username and password as a new user account to the system. Or perhaps um, tell it to wget a backdoor or something like that. Um, it's somewhat friendly to use. Um, it by default generates encoded shell code, uh, shell code um, and it actually is non-deterministic. So your mileage may vary um, because the the choice it may have decided on to encode may fail or may actually produce null bytes or bad bytes. So there are a number of uh, important flags, and I have an example command here. So <coughs> essentially the payload or vector uh, is denoted with hyphen p, and what follows it is essentially uh, some, sort of, um, some sort of feature on that architecture that allows you to execute custom commands. For instance, in Linux, x86, the classic exec. Basically pat, put, push the arguments in the right way or however it's the, 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 the calling convention is and pass it basically the parameters you need to execute bin sh for exec to execute bin sh. So this is exactly what would uh, be set up for MSF. So uh, a here specifies architecture. I think it actually may be redundant in this case because it's specified there. Um, B specifies actually the bad bytes to avoid almost always uh, uh, zero, zero should be specified. It, uh, yeah. But like I said, the encoder may uh, generate encoded shellcode that does have zeros in it if it's not told specifically to avoid it with this uh, MSF and utility. So, hyphen i tells it the number of times to actually encode. It is common for the encoder to encode uh, with the chosen uh, algorithm at least about four times. Sometimes it'll do 20, maybe it'll do 100. Um, obviously, the more the better, even though, so say, say think about it like this. Say you're an antivirus company and you have three encoders that are out there in the world. And let's say the security market is gone. If you have three encoders, what you can do is you can take your payload, say encode it with option A, take the output of that, encode it with option B, then encode it with option C, and then so on, and so on, and so on. There's only so many, basically, possibilities you can iterate through at the end of the day. So as an attacker, the amount of times you choose it to encode, obviously, the better because you're playing the odds there of how much are the antivirus companies and them actually willing to iterate through to add to their signatures. Because if they're willing to iterate infinite amount of times, then they're going to have to push out an infinite sized file out to their clients to update their signature list. And no client's going to like it when, hey, my antivirus just filled up my hard drive. I can't do anything now. So there's only a limited amount that they can actually do to go to beating this. So um, here's an example where I've instructed it to iterate zero times. So there's no encoding done whatsoever. And you can see that there's actually uh, no bytes being generated. And thus, if this is used in any sort of buffer or flow, this will fail. So when specifying it to iterate three times, it uh, basically gives the output of each iteration. And you can see that the size of the, the payload uh, increases with each iteration, which makes sense. Um, because you have to 
unless unless someone comes up with a genius way to in place encode and decode everything in multiple iterative ways, uh, I, I don't see how you could have this uh, possibly be uh, anything other than the way it is. Um, and so this goes on past the page, and it doesn't generate uh, any null bytes, any bad characters specified. So uh, this example was basically for spawning bin sh. Um, getting exec to spawn bin sh. Um, you don't have to go to that level of detail. You can use basically more standard uh, Windows uh, bind TCP shells. Um, and you can also specify the encoder. So the, the most commonly used one, the Shikata Gainai. Um, and so this would be the output of that. As you can see, uh, the size increases with each iteration. So, hopefully I'll get through everything. Um, I want to make sure to stop me before it gets too late to go over the midterm. So this brings me to one of the coolest things that Metasploit kind of spawned and supports and it's kind of a, like a, a symbolic relationship almost. Um, the Social Engineer Toolkit uh, is developed by the team at socialengineer.org. Uh, Chris Hackney, I had Mag, I can't say his name. He's an awesome guy. I actually contacted him out of the blue about something and got back to me right away. I didn't even expect it. Um, so it's always nice to see developers behind really big uh, uh, projects uh, be responsive and quick with the community. Um, so Social Engineer Toolkit is something that has been, actually it's quite young, but it has had skyrocketing success and is now considered the industry standard for any social engineering uh, penetration testing attacks. In essence, the Social Engineer Toolkit augments your ability to schmooze people and manipulate people with a feature-rich technical arsenal. Um, it all has all sorts of amazingly creative ways to attack human stupidity, curiosity, habits, and um, the main terminology we need to talk about before going into it more is that basically it categorizes everything instead of Metasploit-like modules, it categorizes everything with attack vectors. So each attack vector category is basically a avenue for gaining information about or gaining access to a system. So there's web attack vectors, there's email attack vectors, there's USB attack vectors, say you want to do Stuxnet again to someone else. Um, there's tools that will let you do that. So the features in this toolkit allow you to uh, automatically create and send credible looking with uh, solid uh, email headers, uh, phishing emails. It allows you to on the fly uh, scrape a website like PayPal or a bank or Twitter and clone it and then you host it also automatically um, and you can also spoof uh, templates. It allows many different ways to do man in the middle. It'll, it allows the totally easy generation of custom malware, um, say PDF exploits that you want to attach in a phishing email. Um, uh, also different custom exploits, perhaps for a browser, uh, vulnerability, custom media, say you want to exploit a flash vulnerability, uh, custom QR codes, say you want to have a business card or some flyer around campus, as everyone know what the, the, the 2D the, you know, barcodes are now, the three, they're QR codes. You take it, basically a picture with your phone, and it'll pop it up in your browser on your phone. So if you have a, a if you have a website that you can host, basically malicious. Uh, if if you have basically a mobile browser exploit, you can easily uh, uh, own anyone that decides to uh, scan that QR code. It also supports the automatic generation of custom applets that download stagers and so much much more that I'm still actually still learning. Um, so there's a little bit of assembly required, basically just turning on things in a configuration file. If you want it, uh, it will take five seconds. So uh, this is where I leave the slides and actually do it. So I have a Windows XP 
64 bit system here, and um, I have it running at 102 IP and have my attacker running at 103. So, what I'm going to do is in my first example, um, I'm going to actually clone, a, uh, host a website, a version of a website that perhaps I can get the user to uh, visit. And I'll talk more about that as I do it. And then host malware on it that if the user lets it run, will totally own the system. So, start set, and hopefully the demo works. So, can everyone see that? The bottom left. Okay. Uh, it provides various different options. Everything is almost numerically commanded. Um, I'm just going to select social engineering attacks. And then it prevents me in next menu. Do I want to select spear phishing attack vectors, website attack vectors, infectious media, payload listener handlers, mass email attacks, Arduino based attacks, text message spoofing attacks, wireless access point basically spoofing attacks, similar to what Carmetasploit uh, does. There you have the QR attack vectors, and then third party modules and stuff like that. So we're going to go with just basically website attack vector. And I'm going to go with uh, the Java applet attack, which is the first one. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about the second ones, or the next ones. So option two is Metasploit browser exploit method. It essentially uh, will host on this website that you're about to spawn a exploit that will uh, utilize a vulnerability in the victim's browser. Say they're running an old version of Internet Explorer and it hasn't been patched as a vulnerability. It will exploit it, hopefully. Um, you know, your mileage may vary here. Exploitation is a tricky part. There's a lot of nuances that can cause things to fail. But it has functionality to support that. It also has really cool functionality to completely man in the middle, uh, harvest credentials, and then pass off the connection as if it never happened. So essentially, it will scrape and clone the, the whatever page you give it for the domain, say it's bank.com. And so you go to bank.com, and if you navigate to the attacker's version, you'll be presented with an exact clone, and you have the login password prompt. If you decide to log in without the HTTPS, it'll pass the basically the password and user, the username and password credentials to the uh, attacker. The attacker will store them, and then it will pass off the connection back to the original uh, website and disconnect itself from the mix like it was never there. Um, and it's all completely automated. Um, and there's various other ones that are really interesting. So I'm going to, because I have to talk about the midterm, just jump right to the Java applet attack method. So the reason why I'm using this is because it's Java. And I don't really need to say much more. Um, Okay, so the thing about Java applets is that basically Java allows uh, allows you to sign an applet with any name you choose. So you can totally fudge the the certificate, and so uh, you could say this is signed by Bill Gates from Microsoft in the trusted apps development team, and you could have trusted, 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 trusted all over the certificate. And you might actually fool someone because most of the time when people are asked about certificates, they say, yeah, I trust it anyways. Um, so given a large enough company, corporation with thousands of people, you're guaranteed to have success with this. Um, so this attack vector provides an applet that auto detects the user's browser type and then for that browser type, delivers a custom payload to that victim's machine. And so actually Java does not consider the means by which it does this to be a vulnerability in Java at all. In fact, it's a feature. So this will never, ever, 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 ever get fixed. So it is highly effective as well. 
up because it's Java. And I'm sorry for circular logic, but I think they use a lot of that too. So, um, at the next step here, I've selected that I want to use the Java applet attack method. Um, I can choose to use an existing template, or I can actually clone an exact site that I want to use. Um, here, I'm using host-only adapter between my virtual machines, so it doesn't actually have access to the network. Um, so I can't do that. Or I could cut, import a custom website of my own design. Um, I'm just going to go with a standard template. Um, it asks you basically about uh, NAT and port forwarding uh, details. I'm going to select no because in this instance, I am on the same uh, LAN as the victim. So <clears throat> I need to specify my IP address, which is going to be 103. Who can tell me what the problem with this forensically is? Yeah, I'm revealing some information about my basically attack. So there's five examples. Um, I'm going to choose the one for Twitter. So it's going to be a clone of an old version of Twitter. Um, and now I have to specify the payload that I want to generate. Since this is a 64-bit system, uh, I need to have 64-bit exploit. So what I'm going to do is a Windows interpreter reverse TCP for 64-bit. I'm going to use the, the def default listener. And now set is actually going to go through the process of setting everything up. So hopefully it all works. So here it's, it's dynamically generating the, uh, the shell code for two different architectures um, just because it's designed to be flexible and uh, detect basically um, which version of the browser the user is using. Obviously the 32-bit and the 62-bit version of the application will differ, um, so they have to have basically the applet uh, shell code that applies, applet code rather that applies. So <clears throat> I should note that the payload I chose was Windows specific, so even though it's attempting to generate it for uh, OS X and Linux, it's probably not going to work in those instances. So it's finally actually uh, launched the website. It started a basically it started Apache and launched the website and it's given me very verbose information because I've configured it too. And now if I happen to as the victim have my website essentially my traffic direct me to this URL. Uh, to the IP address of the attacker, who can tell me how that could be accomplished? Exactly. ARP spoof, or you could forge DNS, uh, basically, replies, intercepts, if you had to. So you see that we get a website here. Um, I don't know why it's a little slow, but these things happen. So what happens right away is that um, I'm prompted as a victim to allow access for this applet to run. Now, anyone with half a brain is going to say no. But like I said, given a large enough company, you have thousands of people, you have people working in uh, you know, accounting, they don't know this stuff, they may say yes. Besides, it says secure. So even if you did, you click more information, 
There are some problems in here because I used it just like totally out of the box. The signature has expired and various other things. But um, actually, I have slides in this, so I'll skip past this. You can configure the details of the certificate. So if I say I accept this and I want to run, I hit run. You can see this activity going on in my Metasploit session. And if I look at sessions, I have one actually that has been caught and is currently being listened to. Um, so this exploit has worked. So now I want to actually take, uh, I want to switch my context to this interpreter shell. So I do sessions hyphen I and type ID. So the ID for this one is one. So I have interpreter access now. I'm going to look uh, basically at the details of this box. And I look at the IP address information for it. And it is clearly not my IP. So this is successful exploitation of the victim. And look how little I actually even had to do to actually pull this all off. It's hilariously easy in the cases that it does work. Um, so social engineering is widely being recognized as the easiest way to pwn people. Um, if you do actually go to DEF CON, uh, you should totally check out the, the social engineering capture flag. Um, Chris had Maggie, keep getting his name wrong. Um, he hosts it, it's totally awesome. It's so awesome that actually the head of the NSA stopped by to visit it and gave him one of his golden coins. He only gives about like five of these out to like the top people in the world. And so these are like people that we don't even know who exist and stuff like that. So <coughs> that's how important this stuff is um, because it's actually, it's hilariously easy. So I'm going to stop and talk about the midterm. So the midterm uh, follows everything I've said so far.